There are two types of bike packing and touring cyclists. The first is those that buy a stock bike, attach their gear, and head out on an adventure. Though I wish I was, this is not me. I need to carefully consider my environment, factor in the combined weight of me and my rig, and then determine what drivetrain will work best. In this video, we'll cover gearing and drivetrains that work best for bikepacking. If you are the type that likes to get on and ride, this video is for you. But there's still enough info here for those like me, so you may learn a few things about bikepacking drivetrains. This will be a useful one, so let's get started. If you're new here, my name is Joe. I love bikes, adventures, and enjoying how freaking amazing life is. If you like any of those things, hit subscribe. And if by the end of this video you found it helpful or entertaining, click the thumbs up. This is the third video in the bikepacking series. And like the videos on bikes for bikepacking and saddles for bikepacking, I'm not gonna tell you which one is best. Ultimately, that will be determined by your riding environment and style. There are way too many options out there to cover every drivetrain. So many that I will do a few multi-drivetrain videos in this series. I'll give you a ton of options here while we ramble down the murky road of gearing and compatibility. Don't worry though, this video won't be technical. I'll do the heavy lifting on the math and compatibility. Making things easier for you is the focus of this video and series after all. But if you are interested in the technical details of drivetrain math and compatibility, Check out the video linked above on my Sova Wolverine drivetrain, where I talk about all the technical details, including range, gear inches, and why the heck brifters and drillers became incompatible after 11-speed drivetrains were introduced. Before we delve into drivetrains, let's talk about bias. I prefer drop bars, and therefore road brifters. I also love a 2 by system with a cassette cog that has so many teeth you think there was a pie plate on my bike. I'm also a SRAM man. Shimano has some great things going on with GRX, but I love the simplicity of the single click. I'm gonna try my best to keep my opinions out of this and give you the best options for riding styles and environments. I've tried them all. I've mixed and matched. I've built many mullets, dabbled with the People's Libertarian, and went full retro three by to get the range and low gear inches to climb the Cascades when I did the Northern Tier route several years ago. If every bit of that didn't make sense, fret not. It's not necessary to know the technical aspects of what you're riding to love what you ride. But if you have specific questions, especially on compatibility, send me a message on Instagram or shoot me an email. Links are in the description for both. What should you look for in a drivetrain for bikepacking? That depends on the type of bikepacking you'll be doing. A rider heading to the Appalachians will have different needs than a rider passing the Huskers of Nebraska. But for the purpose of this video, let's assume most of us can't afford dozens of bikes for every riding environment, and that we'll be carrying extra weight while bikepacking. But we'll still want to ride fast in the flats. Not race speed, but fast enough to shovel pizza into your mouth sooner than later after your ride is done. This means we'll need a drivetrain with low enough gear inches to climb hills and high enough to ride fast. What the heck is a gear inch? For a detailed explanation, check out that video linked in the description. But simply, a gear inch is a measurement of mechanical advantage, typically ranging from around 20 to 120. Lower gear inches require less power to pedal, and higher gear inches require more. That means you would typically be using your lowest gear, your granny gear, to climb the steepest hill, or riding with extra weight, and your highest gear to ride fast in the flats. Let's simplify this even more and set some gear inch parameters. An ideal drivetrain for bikepacking will have a low gear inch below 20 and a high gear inch of around 100. Gear inch range can be calculated using the size of your chain rings and cassette cogs. Wheel size and tire width will also work into the calculation. For all the drivetrain options in this video, we'll use the most common wheel size, 700C and its equivalent, the 29er. If you're using a smaller wheel like 650B or 27.5, this will change the gear inch range. I've built a useful gear inch calculator on my website. Check out the link in the description if you want to calculate your gear inches. To achieve this gear inch range, you have three options. Old school three buys, the ever popular two by, and the new kid that's all the rage, the one by. The less chain rings you have on front, you'll need a larger cassette cog to achieve the low gear inches ideal for bikepacking. There are a lot of great reasons to use a one by. It's simpler, left hand shifting is a thing of the past, there are less cables to deal with, and the cockpit is cleaner. And since there's no need for a front mech, there is some weight savings. Are we concerned about that as a bikepacker? Uh, maybe some of us. But getting rid of that mech also frees up space for wider tires. Many stock gravel, adventure, and bikepacking bikes are kitted with a 1x from SRAM or Shimano. It seems every gravel and bikepacking rider wants a 1x. 
Are they popular because riders truly want them? Or is their popularity because it's what component manufacturers are producing and have strong contracts with bike manufacturers to install them on their bikes? I'm not into conspiracy theories, but I don't think we'll ever know the answer to this chicken or egg question. But despite all the benefits of one buys, they are not always the best choice for a bike packer. The problem with one buys is it's really difficult to get down to the 20 gear inches you'll need. Choosing chain rings in a cassette cog is often a balance and sometimes a compromise. If you want to go fast in the flats, you'll need a big chain ring and a small cassette cog. If you want to climb hills loaded with gear, you want a small chain ring and a large cassette cog. If you want to get close to both, you'll often compromise on one or the other. This is exceptionally true with a one by setup. When SRAM's 12-speed Eagle came out about five years ago, it really shook up the market. It has a huge range. Let's put together one of SRAM's offerings. A 38-2 chain ring and a 1052 cassette fitted with a 38mm tire on 29er wheels. Let's call this setup the Great Egret Bike Packing Bike. Well, that's a bit of a tongue twister. Better yet, let's call it the GE. With this Eagle setup, you're riding moderately fast in the flats with 104 gear inches and climbing hills with a respectable 20 gear inches. The problem is, Eagle is flat bars only. If I was a flat bar bike packer, this is the setup I'd go with. It's a simple and convenient out of the box setup that doesn't require too much math and zero compatibility issues to deal with. What if you want a one by with a drop bar? Here your range goes down and your compromises go up between choosing upper and lower gear inches. Gravel biking and bike packing have exploded in popularity and with that genre specific drivetrains have as well. Shimano's GRX one by drivetrains are a great example. But you don't have the same range or gear inch options as with flat bar one by systems. The one by GRX setup with the best range option is an 11 speed 1146 cassette. Let's try the GE again. With this setup, you'll drop to 94 gear inches on the top and 22 on the low end. Again, that's with a 38 tooth chain ring, and that's above our 20 gear inches for loaded riding. Let's try and get that down below 20 with a smaller chain ring. Let's try a 32. Now we're looking at 19 gear inches. We'll be climbing mountain ranges with that. But when we take a look at the upper gear inches, we fall to 78 with that small 32. That would be frustrating when we're on a long road with a good tailwind. We just won't get the speed we want. Let's take a look at SRAM's one by options like Forest, Rival, and Apex. Here we see the same issue. The same setup shows the same results. So what's the answer? In the next video, we'll go the other route and take a look at two by and three by drivetrains. Now let's move on to some great comments from previous videos. In the best bikes for bikepacking video, Dan Stennis says, in the PC world, anyone can build a desktop PC after watching some YouTube build videos. I'd like to be able to do that with a bicycle. Can you make videos on how to build a value adventure bicycle that has all the necessary features of an adventure bicycle? Please include the components and tools needed to assemble them and where to buy them. Being a value bicycle, please consider cost versus performance and maybe listing the best components at different prices. Dan, this is a great comment. I am definitely one of those that has benefited from YouTube when I built my editing PC I used to create all these videos. And I love your idea of an adventure bike value build. It's something that not only viewers of this channel can benefit from, it's something that I can benefit from. I've got some really good plans with the Wolverine and I think I can use that frame to do so. In the Specialized Verge Sport versus Comp video, Dan Hyde says, is Kate happy with her choice of the sport after several months have now passed? Have any modifications been made to the sport since you made this video that you would recommend? Being Kate's diverge, I had her respond to Jay in this comment thread. She said, great questions. I love the bike. Frame and drivetrain have been perfect for me, but I did upgrade the seat post to the Roval Terra, which I'm delighted with, and changed the stem for a greater stack height. My only disenchantment is there's no fork bolt option for a permanent Dynamo Hub powered light. I love my Bush and Miller IQX but I had to retire it for now. That was Kate's comment, I'll just expand on it a little bit. The Diverge is a great bike, but there are just some things that make it a little bit more to go long distance bike packing with. And the lack of an option to bolt the light on the fork crown is one of those things. With a Dynamo Hub, you would need to attach light to your handlebars. And Kate really likes a clean cockpit, so that's not an option for her. If anybody has any suggestions of using a Dynamo Hub powered light on the Diverge, go ahead and leave a comment below. And speaking from experience, that Roval Terra seat post is an amazing seat post. It's by far and away one of the best seat posts I've ever had underneath my butt. 
In the Everything You Wanted to Know About the Future Shock video, Michael Weinstein said, I have a question. What about a service life of the Future Shock 1.5? Some say that it is 500 hours and then it has replaced or serviced. Around 2018, there was a lot of talk with the 1.0 Future Shock only having a service life of about 500 hours. I've never seen a document from Specialized stating that this is true. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and that doesn't mean that that can't be true with the 1.5 or the 2.0 as well. But for me, 500 hours is a lot of ride miles. After 500 hours, I'm replacing or servicing a lot of components in my bike. I think we should all treat the Future Shock like any other component. Ride with it until it doesn't work anymore, then get it replaced. So thanks for watching. Ride safe out there, seek adventure, and keep your wheels rolling in the right direction. I'll see you in the next video.